You're right. Um, so anyway, thank you for, for having us here to talk. This is one of the more exciting ventures that we're considering at Katy Perry Conservancy. Um, and it's one that I think is um, going to become, as we enter into this new era called the sixth extinction, it's going to become more and more important. Um, how many of you guys have heard of that term, sixth extinction? Okay, a lot of you guys have sixth extinction. So basically, we are in a spasm of extinction, right, worldwide. And so what, we, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of set up the conversation about uh, what's going on with the horned lizard and, um, and also why we think from a conservation standpoint, Katy Perry Conservancy is interested in this. And, um, and then Cassie's going to come up and talk a little bit uh, about um, her work with the Conservancy to try to figure this puzzle piece out. Um, I sent her on a quest last, when did the quest start? Did it start last year or early this year? In April of this year, it's been a long year. Um, but it's a very important quest, and that quest was um, looking at four iconic species that were on our local prairies and finding out the feasibility, both scientific and economic, and also, uh, also from an infrastructural standpoint, what it would take to bring back some of these, some of these animals. Why horned lizards? Well, I'm going to let Cassidy talk to you about that. Um, it's important to know, though, that um, as we work to, uh, to assess the situation with Texas Parks and Wildlife and with other partners like the Houston Zoo, that we don't have all the answers, right? We are going to be trying things if we try things, but I think that we, we are on to a right track and, and all of that is, is, is due to Cassidy's work, so I'm very excited to move forward with this. Um, you're also probably wondering why, if, if I'm the education director, I'm doing this. I do a lot of restoration work for the Conservancy and scientific work, so my job title is about to change, we think, and it's going to more closely reflect the fact that I'm doing science and education. So, um, all right, so Lane just mentioned this, uh, the Prairie Conference. I'll plug it real quick. It's going to be super exciting, really great talk, uh, speakers this year, uh, right over here at the Houston Zoo on the 12th and 13th, and they're going to have four workshops throughout the region. Um, and they're, I think it's fairly modestly priced. Uh, we do have day passes if you don't want to do the whole thing, but this is really, uh, this, this conference is really about taking care of ourselves as a prairie community in Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, as much as it is in projecting and trying to build the army. So this is a way to connect with the very best prairie people in those three states. This is your chance to do that. We brought it back to Houston because we wanted to treat our people in Houston again after going to Kingsville and, and Fort Worth uh, because they, there's so much dynamic work here going on in Houston that people are kind of amazed at what we're doing. So we wanted to bring it back. And if you go to Southern Plains and Prairies, it's all up there. SouthernPlainsConference.org is all there. Okay, so the first thing we need to talk about is, you know, what is it about horned lizards and why do we even care about bringing back horned lizards? Well, part of this, this story goes back um, quite a ways. It goes, actually, the story didn't start this year in April. It started in 1492, right? So there were some, some, there was a clash of biology and a clash of cultures that happened in that year that had uh, a rippling effect through our local ecosystems. Uh, many of these, um, these ripples, we don't really even, haven't even come to grips with in terms of how our ecology has changed, partially because we don't have a great record of what the ecology of this area was in 1492, in fact, we don't really have a great record of the ecology of this area until you know early into the 1900s and, and some snapshots in the 1800s and things like that. One thing that is important to know is that it does have an impact on how we manage lands, whether we know it or not. There is a concept that was delineated several years ago by a team of scientists, one of which is at the University of Texas. And what they were trying to get at was an encapsulation of, a, of this term, dark diversity. And what that means is, is that there are species that are missing within our ecosystems that continue to have an impact on those ecosystems. They are ghosts, but because of their absence, they continue to have a rippling effect through our ecosystems. And if we, the, the thought is, if we are able to bring back some of those species we will be able to positively impact those ecosystems. Now, I would, I would argue that in a lot of cases, we don't really know enough about how they function in the ecosystem in the first place. It'd be hard to, to figure out what impact they had. Great case in point, and I'm not gonna belabor this one, is the wolves back in Yellowstone and the cascading, the trophic cascade, all these different effects that the, the wolves had when they were brought back 
because they changed the predator prey dynamics, they changed where the, the, the browsers who were taking down the trees along the riparian forest, they literally, there's a great talk on, uh, on the internet about how wolves change rivers. You should watch that talk, I'm not gonna get into that, but just know that part of our function as ecologists is to think about what are all the interactions that are happening, which are multitude, but are there species that maybe are impacting either because they're invasive or because they're just missing and they're native, impacting the ecology of that land. So that's a very important concept. And here in the greater Houston area, we have a lot of missing species. Now I'm working on a, on a checklist for Harris County, a, a historical vertebrate checklist, working with some, some, uh, some birders, some herpetologists and other things. What I wanna know is since Harris County was founded, uh, not founded, but, but populated by Europeans uh, or Americans back starting in the 1820s, how has the vertebrate community changed in Harris County? Which species have we added and which species have we lost? And what do we think some of those changes and those dynamics have, have, um, have done? But it's important to note as well, when we're talking about even something like a horn lizard, that the impact of people goes back uh, a long time, 10,000 years ago in Harris County. So these arrowheads right here uh, were found in Highway 99. There was a dig there that some of you guys are familiar with as it was passing through the Katy Prairie. They found these ancestral sites. Uh, these are ice age sites. And there is a hypothesis called overkill hypothesis that looks at how um, archaeo-Indians uh, in North America and in other places, indigenous people in other places, helped to change the dynamics of ecosystems by wiping out large herbivores and carnivores. And that definitely happened in this area. And so that grassland that we inherited from them was already shifting because of the changes that they made on the landscape. So we think about people's changing in the landscape as being a very modern thing. That's not, I don't think that that's true. So one of the things that people are trying to do, ecologists are trying to do, is they're trying to bring back, they're trying to fill that dark diversity in several different ways. We're gonna talk about perhaps the easiest kind of way, which has all the technical challenges it needs to. One is called rewilding, and I'm not gonna stay on this too long, but there are efforts undergoing in, in Siberia, on a ranch in New Mexico, and several other sites around the, the world where they're taking proxies. So this is what the Ice Age fauna of Herman Park looked like. Um, very radically different, right? Now some of those creatures are still very much apart. In fact, every single opossum, raccoon, squirrel species, coyotes, things that are in your neighborhood, lived with all these things. They're the ones that made it out of that bottleneck. They're the survivors. But all, everything over a certain weight class did not make it out of this bottleneck. So what, what's going on in New Mexico and some other places in Siberia is they're taking analogs. So we don't have the Columbian mammoth anymore. So they'll take an, an Indian elephant as a replacement. They'll take a proxy for a American lion, which is African lion. They'll take a proxy for something like um, these, uh, these tapirs or, or giant tortoises that we used to have here. And they'll substitute them out to see what the, the the ecological dynamics, what, what, how, it, how it functions, how it works, how it changes the ecosystem. That's a very radical view of, of ecology. I think a lot of mainstream ecologists would not agree with this sort of um, Paul Martin type rewilding. But that, that kind of thought process is occurring. Something a little bit even much more costly and, and sometimes even more uh, controversial is this, this concept called de-extinction. So there is a foundation that's been set up just to look into this and to finance projects where they're literally going in and these species right over here to the right. Um, we have several species that are from the Houston area that are on this list. Carolina parakeet, that very bright parakeet, and passenger pigeon, both of which occurred here historically. They're looking at genetically bringing back a close analog of that animal. Now it's not gonna be a truly purebred passenger pigeon and it wouldn't be a truly purebred Carolina parakeet because they have to make substitutions the DNA is too old and it's too fragmented. Now we're not doing any of that stuff at the Cape Fair. <laughs> too expensive. So what we're going to do is we're going to instead, there are those two species by the way, we're going to instead look at reintroduction of specific targeted species. But it is important just real quickly to mention most of the species, a lot of the species that we've lost here. That's sawfish by the way. Uh, was native uh, to Galveston Bay. And that picture was taken in 1938 on Galveston Pier. Uh, those are no longer extant 
here in our area. Paddlefish were common in this area. They're not here anymore for the most part. We still had alligator stamping turtle, although in steep decline. And there were once reported to be so many buffalo fish in, in, in uh, Buffalo Bayou that you could walk across their bodies. Now, probably an exaggeration. But I've been up in Alaska when the, when the salmon are spawning. And it looks like you can do that. We've also lost a whole cluster of carnivores. Each one of these occurred in Harris or surrounding counties historically. And you're probably wondering, like, what the heck? Jaguar. Jaguar went all the way up into Arkansas and covered half of Texas, the eastern half of Texas. And there's still accounts, there are some accounts of, of uh, just south of Houston of seeing some of the last jaguars moving from Prairie Mott to Prairie Mott. It's really kind of interesting. Red wolves, we lost those right in the 1960s, early 1970s. There are county records for diamondback rattlesnake. They're now extant, uh, gone. Ocelots came, came all the way into Galveston at one point. So it's not been but that real quick time period that we've started to see this cascade of lost species. All of these birds, right, gone within the last, let's see, within the last 120 years, at least from the Houston area. Um, so it's important to note that in terms of the Texas horn lizard, a lot of this, some of these species were lost to, to agriculture. So Carolina parakeet was lost because it had a very unfortunate habit of, of being uh, shot at and homing back to exactly the same spots. It was easy to pick them off if they were in an orchard. Some of them were overfished. Some of them had a bounty, like the red wolves had a bounty on them, and they almost got hunted to extinction. Um, but many of these creatures are now extinct in our area because of habitat loss. So these are two pictures of Buffalo Bayou, the way that the settlers and some of the folks who just came right after settlement saw it. Very ancient, tropical looking, you know, cypress trees that were uh, a thousand years old or older. You see the alligator down here. So the accounts that we have early on of the wildlife was that it was abundant, it was uh, diverse, and it was big. Okay, this is a true wilderness. Fast forward today, you go into Buffalo Bayou Park, being renovated, it's been a hard working bayou, now it's coming back. It's, it's interesting, but I don't think we'll ever see the abundance of those animals, much less some of the species. And, um, and so this is kind of the, the ghost ecosystem landscape of Harris County and surrounding counties. So everything that you see in that, in that um, blonde color right there were prairies. So we think of Houston as being a very, uh, you know, tree city, but that's only a relatively recent artifact of, of, of tree plantings and suppression of fire and things like that. And we've lost entire um, ecosystems so in, in, in cultural context, right? So Prairie Street downtown, I've told the story a lot, is called Prairie Street because you could sit on a stoop on those, uh, those businesses and all that you saw to the south was Prairie. That's why they called it Prairie Street. So we've lost a lot of this context and we've actually lost whole ecosystems. I don't know if anybody is, knows anything about the cane breaks. This came, comes out of a real neat book. But that's an ecosystem that was one of the larger ecosystems in the south that is um, based on a, a type of grass that grew specifically along river edges and would have been on many of our river edges here. But it was with some of the most farmable, rich soil. And that's going to continue to be a, a theme real quick in here. So cane breaks are, I think, from a functional standpoint, an extinct ecosystem in Houston. It's not even in existence in any kind of large chunks. There's a little bit on the San Bernard River, but nothing that you can, I can take you and it looks like that. So one of the things that made Texas horned lizards and their, their trajectory so difficult was that we were sitting on an incredibly rich soil bed. It's a map from an old document, and it's called the Cotton Kingdom. And it shows where the production values are for cotton are. This is back in the 1800s. And those were, a lot of those soils were kind of more blackland soils, more clay soils, uh, river soils. But the upland areas on the Katy Prairie and in other places that were loose, sandy, or star loamy soils were also uh, farmed extensively. So you've got two different processes occurring, right? You have uh, wiping out of the ecosystem in, in, in terms of moving in monocultures, uh, soybeans or rice or other, other products. But you also have the large scale, especially post-industrial use of insecticides and pesticides. And that those pesticides uh, reduce the food web in those areas um, and also poison animals because of the consumption of pesticides. A lot of them are nerve agents and things like that. So you have this 
this collision of several different things occurring that is going to end up reducing that Texas horned lizard population. You have large scale landscape transformation, you have um, large scale use of pesticides, and then you have um, this is kind of an advertisement, by the way. It's kind of neat. There's cotton. There's some cotton barges going in. So there was a large, there was a, a huge economic uh, benefit to using our local prairies for farming and ranching. And most, we, we tend to think of cities as being, and urbanization being the reason we lost all this habitat. Truth is, most of the prairie ecosystem that we think about as being the prairie ecosystem in Houston was lost because of farming and ranching. Overgrazing, extensive overgrazing. The first, uh, the first round of prairie restorations in this area actually occurred in the 1890s because we had so overgrazed everything and beat everything up so bad. And then ag large scale agriculture, and you can look at the maps post World War II, the aerial maps, and you can just see the spread of rice farming on the west side and other large scale farming and the leveling of the land. And so we got this, we got this um, increasing world where the potential habitat of horned lizards is shrinking. And then that what's left is is being somewhat poisoned by pesticides. So what we did is, with the conservancy is we said, okay, fine. Anecdotally, we know some of the species that should be um, right for our preserve system, right? And we're missing a whole cadre of species. I can tell you that we have at least that I can think of in terms of reptiles and amphibians, probably 10 species that we don't know why they're not there. It's cryptic. We don't, it's kind of idiopathic. We don't know what the reason is. We expect that if we looked very closely, it would be large scale farming and, and pesticide and herbicide usage. We don't, we don't quite know that. What we do know is that um, many things that we think should be highly abundant, like ornate box turtle, six line race runner, prairie skink, and the list goes on, you, you, northern fence lizard. Those things we should have more green and olds. They're not there. They are ghosts in a lot of ways. So one of the things to do is to step back, look at what you have and what you've cataloged, and we've kept pretty good records of what we have on our preserve system, and think what are the species that we might be able to bring back. And so what we did is we said, well, let's take a first step. Let's take a look at four iconic species that inhabited the area and see what their habitat requirements are and their reintroduction from a legal standpoint and a financial standpoint and an infrastructural standpoint and a, and a staffing standpoint would take. So we decided to take a look at these four. Um, three of them have breeding programs and that was helpful. Um, so we looked at Houston Toad, which Cassidy can talk to you a lot about. We looked at Atwater Prairie Chicken, not as a, as a release right now because they have to actually get to a breeding uh, threshold on the Outwater Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge and maybe the Texas City Preserve before they're even going to release anymore. But we're thinking, part of our thought process is we can come up with a conservation master plan but it's better to have kind of a goal in mind. And one of the goals that I have is if we can make habitat that is at a certain level and good enough for release of Atwaters as an as, as a additional site, then we will have met a certain kind of benchmark for our preserve system. We looked at Buffalo, or bison, um, and uh, and not from a not from a cutesy like let's keep one in a paddock, but can we keep a herd, and can we rotate that herd to function a little bit ecologically? Now, if you're thinking that's kind of crazy, this I actually shot this video inside the paddock at Atwater's uh, Prairie Chicken National Refuge years ago, um, and there were about 60 bison in this blue bonnet herd back then and all kinds of weird trophic cascades started to happen. Uh, one time I went out with the refuge managers, driving out, we saw the buffalo herd. Around the buffalo herd, ringing the buffalo herd, were 30 deer. And I said, what's the deal with that? Well, there's still cougars out there, and there's still a couple cougars on the Katy Prairie. And what the refuge managers speculated was that because of the presence of these buffalo, which had been brought back, these deer were key to stay around them for protection and so before the buffalo came herd, uh, buffalo herd came, the deer were dispersed in the grass, hard to see, moved at night or in the dusk, all that stuff. Now this herd since has been, uh, there was some trouble with the company, they left. The deer are a lot more scarce. They don't huddle up in big herds like that anymore. So 
these things we know have some some side benefits that we can't even guess at. That was one that they hadn't anticipated and it just happened. And the last one was horn lizard. Horn lizard because A, um, each, of, each of these has additional benefits in, from an ecological standpoint in that they're really great on a poster, on a mug, on a t-shirt, in the news, anything like that. Either, any of these are poster children, right? Horn lizard, you know, it's the state's small uh, reptile. Um, it's beloved by school children. It's, it's a fairly docile animal. It's just, it's got all these different things, both from an ecological and a, and a publicity standpoint. And know that modern conservation, you have to be thinking about publicity because publicity means money, and money means that you can do the, the real work, the important work. So all those things need to get factored in. So we decided to ask Cassidy to do the species reintroduction survey, and I can tell you what she's gonna tell you later, but I do wanna mention what's going on with Texas horned lizard real quick. This is a map of the historical distribution of Texas horned lizard. This would have been you know, probably in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. This is what it's today. Massive range uh, decrease. And you're wondering well, what happened there. And I'm sorry, it's a little bit light. These are actually 10 year trends from a, uh, a Texas horned lizard tracker program where they were getting people in the field and they were, um, they were making observations. That doesn't mean that that's the only places where horned lizards are. In fact, a really good uh, place to find that is if you go to inaturalist.org and look up Herps of Texas, which is a way for citizen scientists to mark what they're seeing. They have all the dots for the Texas horned lizard, and it's, it's really kind of fascinating. But you can't go from this to this without asking, well, what in the world happened there? So it's a little bit of a species collapse going on. What happened was a combination of different kinds of farming practices, um, the, the, the ready availability of pesticides after World War II and the, 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 uh, the maturation of the chemical industry. But it's also this, and I wish this were a little bit darker so you can see this, but uh, I'll try to interpret what you're seeing here. This red imported fire ant, I don't think I have to uh, mention to any of you guys what a destructive uh, force on the land this was. So this is not, you know, some people think it's a native species. It is definitely not a native species. They stated to that area in South America. It was brought in accidentally. Several clusters of, of ant species were brought in, but this red imported fire ant, Solenopsis invicta was brought in in the 1930s. Um, in, a, in fruit cases, in the port of Birmingham, rapidly dispersed. And this map, and I'll send you a link to this map, you can't really read this map, but it's really good at telling you when it got to where. Now if you go and you talk to people in greater Houston, old timers, people who've been here a long time, they'll tell you two things. One is, horned lizards were all over the place. Especially talk to the people who moved into Sugarland, or not Sugarland, but Sharpstown when it was new, all over the place. That would be me. That would be you. Okay. And then they'll tell you that they stopped seeing them back in the 1960s, early 1970s. They just kind of blinked out. And and no matter who you talk to in the Houston area, that was pretty much the pattern. And what you can't see here is Harris County fire ants got here in 1965. That's when we think that they arrived. Shortly thereafter, there was a short circuit, and they went away very quickly. And that's because of the fire ant's propensity for messing with other ants. Fire ants are incredibly destructive to other invertebrates. So there is uh, there's some literature that suggests that if fire ant populations get to a certain cluster size, but also if, if the habitat is such that allows them to disperse quickly, that they can destroy up to 80 or 90 percent of the invertebrate community. So sometimes when I'm walking on the Katy Prairie and I'm walking out there and I pick up ticks, um, people are like, oh, ticks are disgusting. I wish we didn't have ticks. What, you know, what good are they? Well, they have one function that I know of, and that is in heavily, heavily infested fire ant areas, you won't pick up ticks because they're eaten. So if you go through an area and there's lots of fire ants but no ticks, it means that there is a, there is a really bad problem with fire ants. It's, it's reached a threshold level. And fortunately on many of our preserves, it hasn't quite reached that threshold level. Another key thing about uh, fire ant infestation is the presence or absence, especially on sandy soils or semi-sandy soils, 
of red harvester ants. So red harvester ants make about 70% of the horned lizard diet. They also eat termites and they eat beetles and they eat other small invertebrates. But if fire ants wipe out harvester ants and that's 70% of your diet, guess what's gonna happen? You are going to be destroyed. So this fire ant population, this fire ant problem needs to be dealt with. Now what they're doing at the Iowa National Wildlife Refuge is they just started two and a half years ago a baiting program for the refuge. Think about how expensive that is, pretty expensive. We had a fundraiser earlier this year to raise money to give to the refuge. It was called Kill a Fire Ant, Save a Prairie Chicken. And what they're literally doing is using airplanes to drop bait. Now I talked to one of the refuge biologists, Mike Morrow, and he said, you know, we thought we had a fire ant problem, but he said, I didn't know until we dropped the bait. He said, we dropped the bait. We went back three hours later to see how much bait was left, to see if the fire ants were even taking the bait. He said that they could not find any bait. Three hours later, no bait. So they used to think for years and years that our prairie chickens were being eaten, literally chicks were being eaten by the fire ants, but what they have found is that they've had a number of wild births and they will find the babies dead, but they're dead of starvation. The fire ants have so decimated the invertebrate population, the insect population, they can't literally find enough to eat, and they starve to death, even though they're healthy otherwise. So that's what they're doing there. So one of the key questions we're gonna have to ask ourselves, and I'll let uh, Cassidy talk about this, is as we're doing the assessment of these potential sites, is what sort of fire ant remediation are we gonna have to do, and can we do it selectively enough so that we don't <laughs> knock out the harvester ants that we, they need to feed on? Now one thing that's uh, kind of exciting is that we are rebuilding prairies on the Katy Prairie uh, to more of a higher ecological function where we can. This is at our Indian grass preserve. And this is kind of time lapse. We've done about 14 months of time lapse photography. Uh, if you want me to show you the whole thing, we'll be here all night. But uh, what we're doing is we're actually reestablishing the, the historic prairie potholes. This is not gonna be a release site for, for, uh, for Texas horn lizard. But it is emblematic of what you can do when you put your brain power and you put engineers and biologists together to start working on it. So these potholes are maybe mm, a little bit more than a year old and last year we had bald eagles hunting them. This year we had thousands upon thousands of frogs including the crawfish frog which is a species in decline that we didn't even know that we had until we built these potholes. So it can be done, this, this kind of work can be done. Uh, we had those black neck stilts born three months after we put the potholes, they were born in those potholes. We had new black neck stilts coming up. So it can be done. So one of the greatest hopes we have, and I'll let Cassie talk a little bit more about this, is this weird artifact on two of our preserves called saline barrens. It's a microhabitat that is um, a lot of unconsolidated sand, and it's home to already one endangered species called Texas prairie dawn. This is it. We have the healthiest population in the world. It's, a, it's an endemic species. And the cool thing about prairie dawn is this. Wherever you have these, these saline barrens and this prairie dawn on both our Warren Ranch and our Jack Road South, that's Wesley Newman, our, our, direct, our uh, conservation director, wherever you have these saline barrens, you have these super healthy populations of harvester ants. So a lot of people have seen their harvester ants completely go away. We still have some pretty healthy populations of harvester ants, and some of the mounds are that tall, that wide. Uh, so they're doing fairly well, and one of our jobs is to kind of uh, do some more assessment of that. Here's Wesley real quick. Um, there's a harvester ant mound right there. So we don't know if this is kind of a strange artifact. Uh, we're still studying these saline barrens in terms of the geochemistry and the, and the soils and everything. How did these things get here? Are they the tops of pimple mounds that were shaved off at one point? Are they their own thing? We don't know, but they, they occur in places you don't expect. So there's a power line easement that Lynn and I are uh, talking about co-opting as a prairie habitat. In town, next to Reliant, it has saline barrens on it. So it's not like a, just a, uh, a one place that you can spot. All right, and we do a lot of assessment with that. So with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over to Cassidy. I'm going to bring her PowerPoint up. But um, as we do that, I am going to show you this map here. So this is our preserve system. 
Um, this is uh, this is the collection of protected lands that both the Cape Prairie Conservancy owns, that's conservation easement agreements on, and other entities have some uh, property out there as well. So you can see that you guys are right about here. Here are we, right here. I'll zoom in a little bit. So um, in terms of this, this, this habitat, uh, we just, last year, like last year we passed 20,000 acres of protected land, which means that you could stick uh, 33 Herman Parks on it, or you could stick Manhattan Island and two memorial parks on it. Use any configuration you want, it's a lot of land. And so our goal is to, to branch out to 30,000 or 50,000 acres, it's probably gonna be closer to 30,000 with the land prices, but this is the basis from which we're going to work, and that's why I want to bring up Dr. Cassidy Johnson. You may get it for you. Yeah. Start speaking. I'll go ahead and grab it for you. Oh, okay. I just couldn't find. It. I was like, where did you go? All the buttons. The projector. Thanks, Jaime. Um, tech support. Um, so like Jaime mentioned, a couple months ago, I was kind of tasked with uh, examining four iconic prairie species to see if this was something that potentially the Katy Prairie Conservancy could work into their long-term conservation plan. Um, of course, the Conservancy is doing a fantastic job uh, mitigating the land and restoring the land for prairie purposes, but as much as I hate to say this, a lot of people in the public are like, you're conserving a bunch of grass? Yay. <laughs> I mean, we're all interested in grass, right? And grass is great and it's super, super important and we get that, but the general public doesn't. But what the general public is really interested in are cool animals, really, really cool animals. So the four species that I was charged in investigating were bison, really cool, they're really big, right? Um, second, the Atwater Prairie Chicken is pretty well known in this area. It has really cool mating displays, so it's really interesting. Uh, the third, and of course my favorite, is the Houston Toad, critically endangered amphibian um, that used to be found here in the Houston area. And the fourth, of course, the Horn Lizard. So I won't belabor you with the results of this document that I put together. If you are interested, I can talk to you about it after uh, the lecture today. But basically, the critter that came out on top for a potential reintroduction was the Texas Horn Lizard. Um, you can't blame them, they're sexy, right? They're really, really sexy animals. There's not a single person on this planet that if you showed them a horned lizard or showed them a picture would say, ew, gross, everyone loves horned lizards. But that's not the only reason. Um, We're in a really good position right now um, because there's been a lot of advents in what we understand about the horned lizard and the Dallas and Fort Worth zoos, and I have a couple of pictures from those zoos, um, of, uh, you know, with their programs that they've been running here in a bit. Um, they've learned how to properly breed these animals in captivity and actually uh, keep them healthy in captivity. Um, one of the reasons that Jaime didn't mention uh, that is believed to have led to the decline of the horned lizard is over collection. Uh, they're really easy to catch, they're really docile. I mean, we all play with them at some point, you know, as kids. And uh, back in the day, it, they were plentiful, they were everywhere. So a lot of little kids made money by collecting horned lizards and literally selling them to people up north, to collectors, for nickels, you know, because they were everywhere and they, they were a novelty. And, you know, the over collection with the advent of pesticides and habitat loss just really took its toll on this particular species. Um, so, uh, let's see. So what I wanna do is talk to you a little bit tonight about the steps that we're going to need to take to start addressing this possibility of reintroducing the horn lizard back to the Katy Prairie Conservancy. We're lucky that the Katy Prairie is already doing a lot of habitat management. Um, it's a protected area. So that is like the first big pressing issue whenever you're trying to conserve or bring back an endangered species is do you have a place to go with the species? And 
yes, check that off the box. So what are the next steps that we need to do? So I want to talk about what we're going to do to work through the, those next pieces. So reintroduction of the horned lizard isn't necessarily oh, yeah, a new thing. <laughs> um, we're not the first geniuses to come up with this idea. Uh, many people have attempted to do reintroductions of horned lizards over the past decade, but they have not been very successful. Um, the number one reason is that there haven't been a good habitat area to release the horned lizards. Um, also, they're kind of hard to follow. Um, we now have new technology with radio uh, transmitting collars that you can attach to the lizards. But when the first kind of reintroduction, or some of the first uh, reintroduction studies were done, these sorts of equipments were not available. Um, an additional problem, uh, actually you can click it so I can remember what I was supposed to say. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Sorry, I've been talking about microbiology all day, so I had to like shift gears in my brain. <clears throat> Um, one of the other problems that um, is confounding any potential reintroduction is the fact that these are a prey species. Anytime you're trying to bring back a prey species, um, all the other animals that normally predate on this animal, they, they don't know it's endangered. They see a lizard, they're going to eat it. So trying to save these animals that are at the very bottom of the food chain can prove to be very, very difficult. So if you're going to do a reintroduction, you need to have mass quantities of animals to reintroduce. You need to have um, some sort of infrastructure in order to protect them during certain uh, critical points of their life stages where they're really vulnerable to predation. So a lot of these things have to be taken into consideration. Let's see. So these are just a couple of examples, and I don't know why that was out of order, of some uh, projects, range production projects that uh, were attempted in the past but were not necessarily successful. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with the, the Horn Lizard Conservation Society. It was started several years ago by a couple of people that just really cared about horn lizards. Um, they attempted a couple of uh, reintroduction where they actually collected wild lizards and took them to a place where horn lizards were no longer found. And unfortunately that project, they re released about 50 lizards and unfortunately wasn't very successful. They lost the majority of the lizards within the first couple of weeks. Um, the Fort Worth Zoo also has attempted to do several captive reared lizard releases. Um, again, they just didn't have a lot of lizards to release. Um, they're re releasing like 20 and 30 at a time. So uh, those two were not incredibly successful. But you have to start somewhere um, when you're going to start thinking about doing these sorts of programs. So um, is there hope for doing uh, some sort of reintroduction with the horn lizard? Yes, absolutely. There has been a lot that we have learned about the species just in the past eight years. So for the longest time, it was considered uh, that they really need a lot of open space. Now we know they like a mosaic type of habitat because you know, they're ectotherms that have to regulate their body temperature. They prefer areas that are about 60% um, open and 40% vegetated. Um, we are now understanding a lot more about their biology. Even though these animals have been studied since the 60s, um, we still just didn't know a whole lot about them because they're already in decline by the time researchers finally got out to really investigate what these little guys do during the day-to-day -day lives. The Dallas Zoo has actually been running about an eight-year uh, research study on a, the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch, which is in North Texas. They've been following about 200 horned lizards that were naturally found in that area. And they're about to wrap up that study, so they're gonna have almost a decade's worth of research on the habitat preferences of these lizards, the exact type of soil that they prefer, the vegetation that they prefer. So we're about to have a massive amount of information of uh, consider, uh, concerning the exact habitat types that the horned lizards uh, prefer. Um, what's interesting, uh, the reason this research is being done on, on a quail ranch is that there is a lot of uh, similarities between the types of habitats that these two organisms like. So they've actually found in other parts of the state where you have healthy quail populations, you also have a healthy horn lizard population. Um, they you know, live completely different lifestyles, they're not interacting with each other as far as we know. But if you can restore habitat for quail, you can restore habitat for Houston, or Houston, I always said Houston too, for horn lizard, and so vice versa. Um, the other great piece of news that um, has come about the past couple of years 
is that both the Dallas and Fort Worth zoos have gotten very good at breeding horned lizards in captivity. Horned lizards are actually very difficult to keep. Um, they have a very persnickety diet, and it's actually hard to raise big colonies of uh, harvester ants in captivity to feed out to the horned lizards. It actually becomes very, very expensive. Um, but the Fort Worth Zoo actually perfected this about three years ago, and they're now every year have about a clutch of 200 um, uh, horned lizards that they actually send out to other zoos. Uh, but they're really, really interested in using what they've learned about breeding these animals in captivity to start making animals to release back into the wild. Um, they've done a couple of studies. They've gotten very good at designing radio transmitter collars that will go on the horned lizard that they can keep uh, track of them for a very long time. So we're at a really, really good place to start thinking about a big reintroduction study. Everything, all the stars are aligning, you could say. We're about to know a ton about their biology, and we have two institutions that can make enough horned lizards to actually make a difference. So what are the next steps then? Um, oh, oh, sorry, one other study I want to tell you about, and I actually have a little video, hopefully it'll work. I just realized that we'll have to huddle around your speakers of your laptop. <laughs> There's one other study I need to mention that's really important. So Texas Parks and Wildlife, is actually doing a translocation study. So what translocation means is when you take a wild animal and move it from one place where they're abundant and put it in a place where they are not abundant to see if they can thrive in that secondary environment. And so they worked with several private landowners that have horned lizards on their property, collected a group of them, I think it was about 40, and translocated them to an area in Central Texas. It's called the Muse Mountain, management, oh sorry, wildlife management area. And uh, so this is the first kind of big scale experiment of its kind. Um, they set up an exclosure where they actually kept the horned lizards inside for 10 days. And then after a period of acclimation, uh, basically opened the exclosure up, let the lizards uh, dissipate, and they've been tracking them for about two years. So they have a lot of data on, again, habitat preferences and how well lizards that have moved are doing in their new environment. So again, uh, another uh, great study that is going to produce a lot of really important data as we move forward. So what is it going to take for us to reintroduce the horned lizard to the Katy Prairie? Well, like I mentioned, fortunately, all the prairie work, the, the work going into restore the habitat out of the Katy Prairie is exactly what we need. <laughs> Getting rid of invasive species, um, fire ant treatments, um, just basically managing for the native plants that exist in that area is key number one issue for any sort of recovery program. The second thing um, that it's going to take to reintroduce the horned lizard is a series of surveys. So a true reintroduction has never been done with this species. There's just been these kind of little experimental projects, but when I contacted Texas Park and Parks and Wildlife about this, they don't even have the right kind of permit for us to fill out because this has never been done. So um, just kind of as a precursory, um, I guess, I guess what, since it's never been done, based on what is known about other sorts of recovery plans, say the Houston toad um, and other sorts of species where this has been done, um, in most of those instances, you have to, of course, do a survey of the area to make sure that it is suitable habitat for any um, animal organisms that you're going to bring in. So the first thing on the docket is to do a series of one or two year uh, uh, transect studies of a couple of the potential sites at the Katy Prairie Conservancy to look at vegetation, um, to look at harvester ants. They, of course, have to be present if we're gonna bring any lizards back. And also, just to double check that there aren't any hidden populations of horned lizards out at KPC. We assume that they're not there, but we haven't done a really careful analysis to see if they're there or not. So those are key issues that need to be settled first. And then once we have um, a good set of data uh, established, then we can move forward in conjunction with Texas Parks and Wildlife to consider what our next steps will be. Will we be, is there a, the potential for us taking translocated lizards from another site? Or will this be a completely novel project where we are going to take captive raised lizards and bring them out to Katy Perry and see if we can establish a, uh, a breeding population out of the site? So um, the next, so 
Jaime already kind of showed y'all where the Katy Prairie is, so that's it in the red circle. So one of the putative areas where we think will be a really good site for a reintroduction is an area uh, called the Warren Ranch. So it's, I don't know if y'all have been out to the field office, but it's kind of uh, to the north east. Sorry, I had to do never eat soggy worms. <laughs> never. It's, it's sad if you're a professor and you have to do that to figure out which way east is. So it's to the northeast of the field office. Um, I am still getting familiar with these areas, so Jaime, if I say something wrong, no, please right, correct right. me. So there are lots of areas of the Warren Ranch that have these salt barrens that Jaime was describing. They're basically big open areas of land, um, incredibly saline, hence the name salt barren, or saline barren, um, where there's little vegetation, but there's vegetation surrounding these areas in pockets, and there are lots and lots and lots of harvester ants. So this would be the perfect site for a potential um, reintroduction of these species. So let's see, go to the next slide. Where are the next? So I actually visited the Warren Ranch earlier in the summer with Wes, the conservation director at KPC, and he kind of showed me around um, the area. And so I selected, mostly arbitrarily, but um, I selected a site at the Warren Ranch that had quite a few of these saline barrens present, as well as just a precursor, precursory walkthrough, there was a lot of harvester ants present. Um, the other reason I selected this site is because it's easily accessible by a road, which is really handy if you need to visit a site multiple times um, that you're gonna survey over and over and over. Uh, so I don't know, if you go back to the previous picture. So I drew a circle <laughs> um, for uh, a Texas Parks and Wildlife research um, permit in order to do this work a couple months ago. Um, the site I ended up selecting is actually a, a little over to the left. So right below the the word Warren Ranch is, you can kind of see where the road is jutting off to the left and down. That's the site that we ended up selecting. So, um, yeah, sorry, I had to switch that thing over a little bit. <laughs> um, let's see, all right, keep going. All right, so a couple of weeks ago, I took a team of volunteers, Andrew, where are you? Which is one of the volunteers that came out. Um, because we just wanted to go get a better kind of sense of what was going on at the site. Um, Wes basically drove me through, we saw some harvester ant mounds, but I really didn't get a good idea of how many there are out there. Um, the reason we care about the number of harvester ant mounds is that the newest version of uh, the a and Press Texas Lizards just came out, and in that um, document uh, mentions uh, some very recent research on the horned lizard that has hypothesized that about it requires about 20 harvester ant mounds to sustain <coughs> one horned lizard. So we need to make sure not only are there harvester ant mounds present, that we have a lot of harvester ant mounds. So I just wanted to get a better sense of this particular area if there, there's going to be enough um, ants present uh, for us to actually release some animals here. So um, we went out on September 26th and did basically a walkthrough and we took GPS points of all of the harvester ant mounds that were found at the site. Um, these are just a, a couple of examples of the, I'm sure there's a scientific name for it, but I like to call them volcanoes. They look like volcanoes. <laughs> um, there are actually 12 harvester ant species in the state of Texas. I did not know that until I started, you know, reading up in it. Uh, the most common one is this Pagona myrix uh, barbatus, uh, which is the one that makes the really, really large mounds. It's actually the most common. So if you see big red harvester ants, it's most likely the species. But there's a couple other, some that prefer to live in forests our forested areas. Um, but this is the one that is also the, makes up the principal diet of the horned lizard. So we've got some out there. So the plan is then to uh, survey this particular site using some standard protocols that have already been put together by Texas Parks and Wildlife. So why reinvent the wheel if the wheel is already working really right? Um, so Texas Parks and Wildlife actually worked in the past with the Horned Lizard Conservation Society to develop a series of protocols. Um, I just put a picture of the document on the right. So um, this is actually a citizen science project that anybody can be involved in. Um, so if y'all are interested and have land of your own that you wanna uh, help contribute to, you know, determining if uh, horn lizards are present or absent, you're more than welcome to join this project. But basically uh, the 
the, the mainstay of uh, this protocol is 100 meter transects. Um, things that, of course, need to be, uh, sorry, <laughs> I've, had, I've been talking for eight hours today, so I'm like, Rrr, my brain's like, Rrr. Um, Jaime knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> you've, been, you've had those eight hour talking days. Uh, so the, the, the way these, trans, these, these surveys work is you use 100 meter transects. They prefer that you cover about a three mile area, um, but whatever space you have, just you know, do. So we, we definitely have that space out of the Warren Ranch, but probably for our first couple of runs, we're gonna you know, do what is manageable. Um, the Horn Lizard Watch isn't particularly uh, concerned about vegetation, but I think what we're going to try to do out at KPC is do a vegetational analysis as we uh, run these transects in that particular area just again to generate some data. Since we now know, or we're about to know from these long-term studies that are being done, exact vegetational information that the horned lizards prefer, I think this is really important information that we need to collect to make sure that we are um, selecting a site that will be the best for potential reintroduction. Um, of course, along with the transects, um, are, we'll be looking at ant density and diversity. I'm not an ant expert, but I happen to know an ant expert that works at Rice University who has offered to do identification analyses for us. You just got real excited back there. <laughs> oh, he's an ant guy, isn't he? Yeah, that's a good idea, that's a good idea. Um, and also, uh, we'll do an analysis of predators, and so, uh, yeah, do analysis of predators as well. So the hawks that we see, the snakes that we see, um, any domestic animals that are feral out in the site. So the hope is, is that we're gonna collect a bunch of really, really useful data so we can uh, basically convince Texas Parks and Wildlife that we've got the golden site um, for a potential reintroduction of these species. Um, yeah, next slide, let's see. So I just wanted to show you a couple extra photos of what we did that day. So this is what a transect would look like. Um, we didn't actually run one of these official transects. I just wanted to put the 100 meter tape down and see what it would look like. Get us in, get a sense of how long it's going to take. Um, horned lizards are active during certain periods of the day, usually earlier in the morning and then in the late evening. Um, it coincides with the activity of the harvester ants one, but also just like us, they don't like super, super hot temperatures. Um, so uh, we do need to have an idea of how long each one of these is going to take so we can properly uh, plan for uh, an outing to get some volunteers out there to actually do some of the survey work. So I think I have a slide in here of what it looks like. So I apologize, I wasn't able to actually put your ant data in. <laughs> I just ran out of time. Um, so this is my data that I collected when we went out that day of the number of harvester ant mounds that we found. Um, so when it says ant mound times three, that means there were very, there's three large mounds in that particular GPS location. So in total, with only about five people actively surveying for maybe an hour and a half, we found at least 54 just in this uh, consolidated area of the survey site. So I think we're in a really good position to say I might have enough food out there to support um, at least a couple of horn lizards. Um, Warren Ranch is covered with these particular areas that might be fantastic for release. So I've actually just as of today got in touch with the state herpetologist uh, Andy Glusenkamp, who in the next couple of weeks or months, we're going to arrange um, a site visit so we can actually come to Warren Ranch and tour the property because he is actually an expert in horn lizards. Um, so he can actually uh, uh, take a gander at the rest of the sites and ensure that we have selected a really good site to do uh, surveys for the next couple of years. So I'm really excited about that. So after we run the surveys, when, then what do we do? So again, we don't think that there are horned lizards present at the Katy Perry Conservancy right now. They haven't been found east of 35 in probably 20 years is what the estimate is. Um, however, you know, we have to do our due diligence to make sure that there aren't some, you know, wandering horned lizards out there that have been lonely for a couple of decades. Um, but the other thing that we'll do is with this data set, we can actually uh, put together hopefully a proposal 
um, that has enough support data to say that we have a site that can potentially support 50 horn lizards, or we have a site that can potentially support 100 horn lizards, or whatever that number may be. And so this is gonna take a lot of collaboration with Texas Parks and Wildlife, as well as uh, the Dallas and Fort Worth zoos, who um, I'm predicting are gonna be the ones that are gonna be producing uh, the animals for us to, to get out uh, to the site. So what I wanted to show you is a video that's actually been put together by uh, the Muse Wildlife Management Area. So they're the folks, again, that did the translocation study. Um, I, in my mind, a potential reintroduction of horned lizards at Katy Prairie will look like this. And um, I forgot that we didn't have speakers in the room, but you actually don't need to listen to them. Um, you can see what they're doing uh, pretty well. Uh, but this is a really, really exciting project that they're doing out there, and uh, I foresee us doing something like this, hopefully, sometime in the near future. It's going to play. You might have to copy and paste it. Yeah. And you can give me that, and on the next newsletter, I'll just yeah. show it out. People can yeah, for sure, pictures. for sure. Uh, good question. How yeah. long do they live? In captivity, the horn lizards can live, I think they've had some live up to 10 and 12 years. But in the wild, they probably live three or four. So again, when you're at the bottom of the food chain, you don't last very long. And they reproduce how many times a year? Once, uh, once a year. So the, the females do lay really large clutches of eggs. Um, the average is about 25, but they've had clutches as large as 45. Is the cover mostly grass or shrubs? Or um, they like bunch grass, um, shrubs, yes. And uh, yeah, they just like it very um, a, a mosaic. They don't like, like if there's a, I'm trying to say, yeah, just that 60-40 mix. So this is one of those questions that has been asked for a really long time. And hopefully at the end of the study at the, the Quail Research Ranch, we'll have a really good idea of more precisely the types of vegetation that they prefer. And I assume they have Yes. There's actually a couple of researchers out of Texas Tech University that have been looking at horn lizard, the, the impacts of fire on horn lizard populations, and they've actually shown there is benefit to fire on horn lizard populations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They actually kind of dig down into the grounds, um, not super deep, but pretty quickly. So yeah, this is... <laughs> Oh, subtitles, great.
digest the color. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah. It chokes him. <laughs> I think this was recorded last year. I know it says on the, um, so that program has been running for about, I think two years. This is their second year or maybe the third year. So it's been really successful. They're still tracking a lot of the scissors. Yeah, so the, the, um, the radio collar technology has just gotten so much better. It's not as bulky. So you can actually, you know, keep the radio transmitters on the lizards for a longer period of time and follow them um, extensively. So any potential uh, program will have to absolutely be um, a partnership. So it definitely won't be something that the KPC has to do alone. Um, it's gonna require, of course, extensive, uh, an extensive relationship with Texas Parks and Wildlife, um, which they have shown sub sub substantial interest so far. And uh, uh, the Fort Worth and Dallas zoos and the Houston zoo as well, although the Houston zoo isn't attempting any breeding of horned lizards, they do have staff that are very interested in herpetology and very knowledgeable that can be of assistance um, monitoring the lizards, um, you know, coming out and doing surveys and perhaps, perhaps getting involved in their breeding sometime in the future. They've always been talking about it, but maybe this will like push them over the edge. Um, and of course, my secret evil plan blah, is to uh, get local uh, university and community college students involved in all of this because you know that these young people are our future. Um, if we're not encouraging these students to care about our environment and uh, the organisms that inhabit it, then there's no point in us doing any of this stuff. So community college students in particular. Um, they are our community. Um, the Rice students, they come and go. They'll come, you know, do their four years. They're, they're great kids to work with, but you know, eventually they, a lot of, some of them stay in Houston, but some of them are, are gonna go back home. Um, but our community college students, they're, they're, they're us. And so I really wanna hopefully get these institutions involved in this horn lizard project and just uh, kind of puke their general interest in, in conservation of the Houston area, so. All right, that's my soapbox, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you.